Far views across Africa and the rest of the world, this is NC Continental Prime. I'm Kofi Bartels. You're welcome. We begin the news at this hour in Nigeria, where the country's central bank has dissolved the board and the management of Titan Trust Bank, as well as three other banks. This followed a report submitted to President Bola Ametimbu by the special investigator on the Central Bank of Nigeria and related entities, Jim Obaze. The others affected are Union Bank, Polaris Bank, and Keystone Bank. It was reported the decision to dissolve the banks was taken, the boards was taken, after a meeting between the governor of the Central Bank, Yemi Cardoso, Obaze, the special investigator, and the boards of the four banks, including Titan Trust Bank's investors, who had earlier avoided meeting with the special investigator. The report of the special investigation into activities of Nigeria's central bank had caused, had accused the immediate past governor of the Apex Bank, Godwin Emefili, of acquiring banks for himself through proxies. The Federal High Court in Abuja on Wednesday ordered the remand of a former minister of power and steel in Nigeria, Olu Ogunle, or Agunloye, in the Kuje Correctional Center, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission had arraigned Ogunloye over allegations of fraud in the Mambila Pa project. Ogunloye was brought before the Federal High Court in Abuja on Wednesday, where he pleaded not guilty to the charges read against him. The judge, however, ordered that the former minister be remanded pending when a bail will be granted. Let's stay with the judiciary. The Supreme Court of Nigeria has reserved judgment for the appeals challenging the election of Abia State Governor Alex Oti of the Labour Party. And after taking arguments from the legal team of the People's Democratic Party and the All Progressives Congress, at the proceedings held in Abuja, councils to the opposition APC and the PDP in the state asked the court to set aside an earlier judgment of a lower court which absolved Oti of allegations of not being a member of the Labour Party. The Apex Court also dismissed the appeal filed by the opposition Social Democratic Party and its candidate Umar Ardo, which sought to overturn the victory of Governor Amadou Fintiri of Adamawa State. Marvelous Obomonu. Has more. The Supreme Court entertained two appeals, one seeking to overturn the Adamawa state governorship election and the other by both the People's Democratic Party and the ruling All Progressives Congress challenging the emergence of the Abia state governor as a candidate of the party. The Court of Appeals sitting in Lagos State had earlier dismissed the appeals filed by the APC and the PDP, saying that they did not produce substantive evidence to prove that Governor Oti was not a member of the Labour Party or that the lawful votes scored were forged. It used to be that one local government in that state used to determine who is the governor. But this time around, uh, the jinx was broken because the attempt uh, to use the same methodology, actually the strategy failed. Uh, we hope the Supreme Court would... Uh, uh, put a final lead on that um, strategy that has been used before to undo the people's will. But we, for now, we keep our fingers crossed. It's a question of resolving XDP 38 and SP 188, all of which came from the same party. And one shows that our clients got a clear 174,000 as against their own world 84,000. And whether the result that was not stamped, that was brought by, signed by a world agent, represented to be local government agent, will suffice. To overturn and so let's keep it and we pray for the allowship for God's wisdom. Meanwhile, the case concerning the polls in Adamawa State, Northeast Nigeria, was also heard by the court. The legal counsel to the nation's electoral body says that the appeal filed by the Social Democratic Party was unnecessary and based on fallacy. The Supreme Court, I mean, they've just shown that the appeal is more or less an academic exercise. And, uh, at the end of the day, INEC should be commended for what it has done. Because for you to go to court and say that uh, up to the Apex Court, you must have a genuine grievance that your rights have actually been affected and substantially affected. Just like you saw, they said, how many votes did you score and whatever it is. The right may be there, but how will it change the equilibrium? What of the issue of constitutional spread and all those things? And I think we must commend them too for having the courage 
to withdraw it. Because not, for me, it's not every case that should come to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court should be a policy court and the final court. But it's not every kind of grievance that should come to the Supreme Court. After hearing the arguments by the various parties for Adamawa State, the appeal by the Social Democratic Party was dismissed, while judgment was reserved by the Supreme Court for the matter concerning Alex Oti of Abia State. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Oboman. Thank you, Marvelous. You're still watching NC Continental Prime. We have more stories ahead. We'll be back after this break with more. Welcome back. Uh, the Nigerian government has set up a committee to look into activities of private universities established in the last 15 years in the country. Minister of Education Tahir Maman made this known during the inauguration of the Inter-Ministerial Committee on Degree Males. He noted that the essence of the directive is to ensure that private institutions under investigation have prescribed facilities, adequate management structure, and adequate funding of programs, among others, in place. So quite an interesting involvement uh, in the conversation regarding uh, degrees in Nigeria from tertiary institutions. Uh, we have Dr. O Peter Ogudoro. He's an education researcher uh, joining us now to unpack this latest development. Dr. Ogudoro, it's good to have you on the news tonight. What's your interpretation of the federal government of Nigeria's decision to establish a committee uh, to examine activities of private universities established in the country uh, in the last 15 years. What implications do you think this will have for uh, higher education in the country? Well, I, obviously this has been triggered by the report of, um, uh, the report produced by one of uh, your professional colleagues who uh, went to Benin Republic and was able to, according to him, procure a university degree within about six weeks. And uh, passed through the National Youth Service in Nigeria for the second time without being detected. And so uh, our systems are, are, are now confirmed to be very uh, flawed. And uh, the assumption is that many people have probably passed through a similar route and, uh, and, and obviously holding uh, certificates that uh, do not uh, match the kind of knowledge and skills that, that, that they possess. In other words, their certificates are, are bigger than them. And so the government is um, trying to look into this and find out how we can ensure that uh, those loopholes are closed so that we do not um, put the, na the nation to ridicule. Because if we don't deal with this problem now, we might find ourselves in a situation where uh, higher, institutional, uh, higher institutions abroad may uh, start looking down on degrees that um, Nigerians uh, obtain from any African country, and that might carry very negative implications for uh, the quality of life available to our people. Hmm. Quite interesting, and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, welcome that you link in this to the uh, expose uh, from an investigative journalist as uh, far as uh, acquisition of degrees uh, by Nigerians from countries in the West African sub-region is concerned. But um, uh, what criteria or parameters do you believe the committee should consider you know, in evaluating the activities of private universities in the country, um, what do you think they should consider? Well, uh, we, in, in higher education, we are interested in we are interested in the infrastructure available for you to deliver the education you 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 you, you purport to pro provide young people. We are also interested in governance. How um, do you run the system? Uh, we are interested in teaching and learning methodology. Uh, have you uh, the right uh, people and have you trained your lecturer as well uh, to be able to provide the quality of instruction that will make your products uh, globally competitive? Uh, if you do my kind of job as uh, a, a researcher in the higher education industry, uh, the truth that we have to confront, which is very unfortunate for us, is that uh, at the level of teaching and learning, we are not doing very well. Quality of access, we are not doing very well. Governance, we are not doing well. Um, funding, we are also not doing well. And so many private universities have been given licenses to run universities when their uh, proprietors 
don't have the means, the, the, the kind of funds it takes to run universities, because many people have come under the wrong notion that universities can be run like typical businesses, which is, which is not true. You can't make the kind of profit banks make, you know, and, and at the speed with which banks make that kind of money. Education is a social good, and so anyone who is going into it for the purpose of making profit is probably uh, living in a fool's paradise. And so many private universities have discovered that they went for licenses for something that, um, you know, they didn't quite understand. And they are, uh, mo many of them are stranded at the moment. They are not able to, to pay good salaries, and many of the electorates are leaving them, and they're seeking for greener pastures, as we usually say, abroad. And so we need to be sure that the people who have given licenses to run universities in Nigeria are actually people who, are, uh, who have what it takes to provide the kind of education universities are supposed to provide. At the moment, many of them don't seem to have what it takes to deliver good quality instructions at the higher education level. Uh, uh, for the private universities, uh, Dr. Goder, what challenges do you think may arise? And not just even challenges, opportunities uh, for them as a result of this, this development, could the committee scrutiny when they come around and want to go through everything. And don't forget, we have the National Universities Commission. So do we even uh, need to be talking about a committee? Yeah, well, again, that has to do with the uh, uh, problem of trust in our country. We know that uh, a lot of times we give um, very sensitive uh, responsibilities to people who have uh, no skills to be able to do these jobs, even when you call them professors. So the reason why you might want to believe that universities, National Universities Commission uh, is supposed to have done a good job because is the reason is it's because um, you know uh, the people who run these places are mostly professors, but we also know that uh, corruption has been uh, a problem that has lived with us for me for a very long time, and so many people have found their way into these kinds of places as a result of cronyism, uh, not necessarily because they have the skills it takes to uh, give us very strong institutions that will prevent. Um, uh, you read the wrong people from getting licenses to run universities. And so the government at this point are probably uh, uh, coming to the conclusion that they, they have made some mistakes and they want to correct those mistakes by bringing, uh, you know, uh, dispassionate individuals to come and have a look at the systems we have, been put, we have put in place over the years to see if we can still trust them. If we cannot control to trust them, then we have to build these systems to ensure that um, our certificates do not become, you know, uh, just mere pieces of paper, which no institution around the world, especially in societies where things are, you know, uh, are done properly, uh, you know, uh, we don't become their laughing stock. Um, do you think 15 years is enough? Do you need to go beyond, you know, 15 years? Yeah, well, uh, the problem is if you go be if you go beyond 15 years, maybe you're talking about 20, 30 years, do you have the resources it takes to prove, you know, to, to go that far? Uh, in fact, even 15 years is, 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 uh, is, is, a, is, is a handful of problems. I, I'm not really sure that it's going to be an easy one. Yeah, but, 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 but Dr. Ongo, if within we're talking about months. cleaning up the, uh, the tertiary education system in Nigeria, then surely every university in this country, at least if it's called private universities, ought to be probed to see what they are doing. Because if you don't, then they're still going to be churning out um, uh, substandard, you know, graduates. I agree to some extent, but we still do have universities in this country that uh, are managing uh, to maintain minimum standards. Uh, universities like University of Ibado, Nsuka Madu Bello, uh, they may not be at the level we want them to be, but um, most of the people running them at the level of our chancellor, his department, these some faculty, are still remembering that universities are indeed, you know, citadels of, of learning, and they are places that we need to protect, especially in terms of reputation and integrity. So writing off all universities in our country uh, just because we have this problem in our hand will not be a way, uh, you know, to be fair and just to, to everybody who is a player in the industry. So uh, some of them are managing to, you know, keep their head above water, but they are only managing. Uh, mm. Funding remains problematic. And many uh, good hands are living our shores because we are not treating the vast lecturer as well. Right. And so maybe this um, uh, uh, committee will, uh, uh, you know, raise uh, the antenna of all the people who are supposed to be giving us good quality education at higher education level so that they recognize that indeed 
Um, ASU has not been crying wolf that they are, we do indeed have a very big challenge in our hands. We are not doing well at the higher education level, and that is not a situation we should continue to tolerate for a long time. Mm. Uh, do you have any recommendations, you know, that you think the committee should uh, a, a adopt in the process of, um, you know, its verification just to enhance the overall quality of tertiary education in Nigeria? And also they to ensure, a, a, sure a, a, fair, a fair assessment, a thorough assessment of these universities as well. Yeah, they should make sure they are dispassionate in the job they are doing. And uh, being dispassionate means they should not uh, throw away the child with the bathwater. For example, the university in Benin Republic uh, that has uh, made us to come to this um, uh, present position uh, is probably a university that is accredited in Benin Republic. But you might have one or two Nigerians who have been through the system and messed it up. Uh, we also have NYSC that has also been messed up, you know, by, <laughs> by these uh, loopholes that we are discussing now. But it's not a good idea to throw away the child with the bathwater. And these places are still providing education. We only need to fish out the bad eggs in the system, uh, throw them out, and put in, in place systems that will ensure that uh, they, they do not return to these systems that uh, should uh, provide us um, the kind of education that will make Nigeria begin to move forward. Because indeed, uh, education remains the bedrock of development uh, until we get it right at the level of education. All other problems we are trying to solve as a country uh, will, will, will continue to live with us. Um, it's, it's a mirage that we are chasing if we continue to believe that merely, you know, having conversations in our parliament without giving our children good quality education from kindergarten to university, you know, will take us to our Eldorado. Uh, so I, I, we should urgently uh, address these matters and uh, fund the education system better, train our teachers better, provide them the tools with which they have to do their job, and give our children good quality access. Make sure we give uh, our young people uh, the tools they need to be able to make appropriate decisions. Right. Deal with the missing links in the education system, including the absence of um, a good career management system, which is the reason why people are looking for things they cannot find. Dr. Peter Ogudoro, education researcher, it's uh, been a thrill having you spoken like a researcher indeed and uh, given us the insight into some of the issues surrounding tertiary education in Nigeria. Many thanks for your time. My pleasure. That almost felt like uh, a lecture right there. Let's move on to other stories in a bit to alleviate the financial strain on parents who are grappling with rising tuition fees in Nigeria. Education has urged the federal government to, as a matter of urgency, implement the student loan policy due to the prevailing economic challenges in the country. Students, however, are calling on the government to reconsider uh, the conditions and criteria for eligibility of the student loan. U Central's Omolola Olorade tells us more in this report. The Access to Higher Education Act 2023 otherwise known as the Student Loan Act, was enacted by President Tinubu in June 2023 to help Nigerians afford the cost of tertiary institutions while they pay in installment two years after completing their participation in the National Youth Service School program. Although the disbursement of student loans to Nigerians is expected to commence in January 2024, as announced by the federal government last year. Findings, according to a report, show that implementing ministries and agencies are yet to ensure the smooth takeoff of the scheme as set by the law. For most students, the start date for the disbursement of the loan is not a major concern, rather the conditions for the eligibility of the loan. Even looking at the, the conditions for the loan, it's more like zero, because it, it will make it not accessible to, to the regular people. So that is not even the case at all. So for me, I don't see it as, as the right option. I don't see it as, as a good thing at all. So it should be cancelled. It's time for them to go and look for 11 to 12 serious habits. It's time them to go and get a screen job a lawyer that is supposed to be a son and you tell me that if i don't pay the loan then after two years of nyc you have to you have, you have, I'll, I'll have to pay a fine or get jail in this current economy is is that not a joke recall that the introduction of student loans policy led to an increment in obligatory fees across tertiary institutions in the country and in reaction to this Students took to the streets on their various campuses to protest the fee increment. 
Unfortunately, the government couldn't prefer any tangible solution to their request, having been told that the student loan was their saving grace. In an interview with New Central, the Vice Chancellor of Unilag, Professor Folasha De Ogunshola, shed more light. I mean, if you say interest free loan, that's not a loan. That's giving you access. What well, you pay back when you have money. So I think it's not that we should have a knee jerk reaction against loans, but we should look at the terms and conditions of that loan. <laughs> The commercialization of education in Nigeria has been up for debate in recent years. While some educationists argue that it could lead to better quality education, others believe this will exclude many Nigerians from accessing education. So what they're trying to do at the end of the day is to commercialize education, uh, create another uh, commercial chain around education. So education would no more be a social investment or a service to the people. It will now be based on who is willing to buy and who is willing to sell. Education is a fundamental human right, hence the call on the government to make it accessible to all Nigerians, regardless of their socio-economic status. In Lagos for News Central, Omolola Ololadi. In its continued fight against drug abuse in Nigeria, the chairman of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency has lauded the launch of the refurbished forensic laboratory, KETSI, the United States Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. The upgraded laboratory, according to the NDLEA, will strengthen operational standards and successful drug investigations. Adeshewa Odushoga reports. Statistics say over 14 million Nigerians are drug users. And the country's battle against substance abuse and illicit drug trafficking has intensified recently due to this steady rise in drug use figures. Nigeria has grown from a drug transit country to a country producing a blend of new psychoactive substances with multiplying undercover laboratories. In its renewed fight against this trend, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency has launched a new forensic laboratory upgraded by the United States Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs and implemented by the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime. Uh, you have quite a lot of new psychoactive substances that were outside of nationally or internationally controlled drugs before you have things that um, our young people are doing now that um, were never envisaged by the framers of our laws. And so with this lab now, um, when you bring such um, substances into our laboratory, we'll be able to detect and analyze the components of some things, and with an ongoing amendment of the um, Enabling Act of the agency, this would um, help us to be able to present um, a good analysis in the law courts, to be able to prosecute some of these people who are involved in the manufacturing or the production of these illicit substances that were either though not captured by our laws. As we know, the common psychoactive substances we have in Nigeria, uh, substances such as um, cocaine, heroin, uh, cannabis, which is the most uh, popular and indigenous to Nigeria, we have methamphetamines. But there are also new um, and emerging psychoactive substances, which we need to build capacity to identify. And without a standard laboratory, we will not be able to do that. The U.S. Consul General Will Stevens said the $500,000 worth laboratory serves as a coordinated, comprehensive, and multidisciplinary global response to what it termed a global opioid crisis, which also affects European countries. We're also going to support NDLEA scientists, send them to the United States so they can learn best-in-class, world-class techniques and procedures, but, and also share with our technicians and laboratories what they're finding here in Nigeria, because we face common threats. We face shared problems, and together, working together with Nigeria, we can combat those problems and find solutions. The execution of this project also includes the training of 20 NDLEA forensic analysts on drug identification and safe handling of synthetic opioids, provision of safety bags consisting of personal protective equipment, supply of 20 test kits for drugs and precursor chemicals for field identification, amongst others. In Lagos, for New Central, Adeshawa Odushoga. 
Staying in West Africa, Liberia's former Chief Justice and Justice Minister Gloria Maya Muso Scott has been sentenced to life in prison for the murder of her niece, Carlo Musu. Her trial had that she, along with three other women, intentionally and maliciously inflicted several bodily injuries on her niece at her home last June. The former Justice Chief denied a Chief Justice and died a charge saying the 29-year-old had been killed by an assassin who had entered her home in the capital, Monrovia. It marks a fall from grace of one of Liberia's most famous judges and politicians who prided herself as a champion of women's rights. Musa Scott, age 70, is now in jail, hoping to overturn the ruling on appeal. Yes, so watching NC Continental Prime and coming up, Somali's armed group Al-Shabaab seized a United Nations helicopter as well as the passengers on board. We'll bring you details of this and more when we return. Welcome back. NC Continental Prime continues in the east of the continent where local sources say the Somali armed group Al-Shabaab has seized a United Nations helicopter along with about eight people on board, both passengers and crew. The helicopter landed in territory controlled by the group in central Somalia. And some reports say it had been forced to make an emergency landing, but other reports say the landing was a mistake. Al-Shabaab controls large parts of southern and central Somalia. The group is affiliated to Al-Qaeda and has waged a brutal insurgency for nearly 20 years. The seizure of the helicopter was also confirmed by the uh, Galmuduk Region Security Minister Mohammed Abdi Adan. In the meantime, Somalia's president says his Eritrean counterpart has declared support for Somalia's sovereignty and amid tensions with Ethiopia over a control controversial sea access deal. Eritrean leader Isaias Afweki voiced this stance in a meeting with Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mohamud during a two-day visit to the Eritrean capital Asmara. Attentions were packed at the beginning of last week after Ethiopia signed a deal with the self-declared Republic of Somaliland. An agreement would give Ethiopia commercial and military access to the ports in the breakaway region of Somaliland. Somalia called the deal an act of aggression, and it considers Somaliland a part of its territory and has vowed to defend its sovereignty. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is facing a significant rebellion from Tory MPs over legislation to revive his plan to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda. Over 30 backbenchers on the right of the party are backing plans to change the bill next week to make it harder for people to appeal deportation. The amendments underline the scale of Tory division over the policy, which the Prime Minister has made a priority. Ministers insist the bill allows only a, v a vanishingly small number of appeals. Those backing the amendments include former Tory leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith, and a clutch of former cabinet ministers, including former Home Secretary Suela Braverman. And now to some health matters, Uganda will destroy expired COVID-19 vaccines worth 7.4 million US dollars. This is following a slump in demand for the jabs with more stocks due to lapse by next year. Uganda's Auditor General John Muanga in a report says the East African nation used a loan from the World Bank to import the vaccines, the vaccines rather, and nearly half of the existing stock of around 12.6 million doses had expired. Muanga's report presented to the Ugandan parliament says the expired COVID-19 vaccines valued at a reporting date was worth 7.4 million U.S. dollars. Moses Kamabari is executive director of Uganda's National Medical Stores, which distributes supplies to 
all public health facilities in the country. And he says authorities will soon end back on the destruction of those expired vaccines. In southern Africa, at least three community leaders in Mozambique have been killed and around 50 houses set on fire following a wave of misinformation about a cholera outbreak. Officials say most of the attacks have been led by the Naparamas, which is a militia group that has taken up arms against terrorists in the northern Cabo Delgado province. Uh, this week, uh, protests accused the authorities of spreading cholera through medicine resulting in the destruction of more than a dozen houses. Local sources say the Naparamas also destroyed a cholera treatment center. Officials have expressed concern that the Naparamas may fuel insecurity in Mozambique unless urgent measures are taken against them. Still with cholera, Zambian authorities expect to receive one million cholera vaccine doses from the World Health Organization amid an outbreak that has killed 249 people since last October. Roma Chilengi, the health advisor to the president, uh, Hakainde Hichilema, uh, says that doses will be deployed at the most, to the most at-risk regions and are due to arrive by Saturday. Hichilema is expected to visit the main treatment center at the National Heroes Stadium to inspect uh, response measures. And the government has delayed the reopening of schools and rolled out further preventative measures in a bid to contain the outbreak of cholera. We have more news from around the world. When we return, please stay with us. We're going on a short break. Welcome back and now to ongoing coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thousands of protesters have marched from Manara Square in Ramallah to the Mukata, uh, where the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is set to meet with U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken to protest against his visit to the West Bank and his support for Israel. The protesters had earlier clashed uh, briefly with the police while approaching the venue. According to Issam Bakr, the state coordinator of the National and Islamic Forces, who accused the United States of being in partnership with the Israeli forces, the protest is a clear message to President Mahmoud Abbas not to meet with Anthony Blinken. We support uh, the, and uh, believe in the two-state solution still uh, exist, but the United States and uh, Israeli aggression is killing any opportunity to achieve this uh, solution. Yes, yes, we, we send a clear message to President Abbas not to meet this killer. He is in a partnership with the Israeli uh, right-wing uh, criminal. And now for some business stories, uh, Perpetua Fasome Peter is up next with the day's business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. In business, Egypt has an alarm utilities and Saudi private water desalination company, Aqua Power, a partnering through a land use agreement for a $1.5 billion wind power project in Egypt. Secured for up to 25 years, the Aqua Power led consortium will help secure financing and secure land for a massive new wind farm built across the Gulf of Suez and Gabal Al Zayt in an ambitious project that aims to be a powerhouse of clean energy in both Egypt and the Middle East. The wind farm will feature 220 meter tall turbines powering up to 1 million homes while eliminating 2.4 million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. In Southern Africa now, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, JSE, remained volatile on Wednesday as investors remained cautious about the ongoing sell-off in commodity shares. The old share index closed 0.35% at 73,429.05 points as mining shares tumbled 2.2%. The sell-off in mining shares was led by Platinum Miner Impala Platinum, which plunged 9.5% to 160.50 revand. Gold miner Anglo Gold Ashanti also fell to 0.4%. 
The decline in mining shares was due to a combination of factors, including concerns about the economic recovery in China, the world's biggest consumer of commodities. There are also worries about rising interest rates in the United States, which could dampen demand for commodities. And our global diamond giant De Beers said it will go ahead with a planned $1 billion investment to extend the life of its flagship Juaneng mine in Botswana, regardless of last year's downturn in gem demand. The Botswana government and the Anglo-American units, which jointly own Debswana Diamond Company, have approved the spending that will convert the Juaneng pit into an underground operation. Debswana said in 2018 it planned an investment to extend the lifespan of the mine by 11 years from 2024. Demand for rough diamonds has been weak in recent months with India, quarter and polish of 90% of the world's rough diamonds, asking global miners to stop selling its gemstones to manage accumulated stocks. And finally, in East Africa, the World Bank has raised its projection for Kenya's economic growth to 5.2% this year, up from its earlier estimate of 5%. The increase is attributed to increased private sector investment and a government reduction in borrowing from the domestic credit market. The World Bank's Global Economic Prospects report states that non-resource-rich countries like Kenya are expected to experience stronger growth with projections of 5.4% in 2024 and 5.7% in 2025. The report also highlights the positive impact of increased investment and improved business confidence in Kenya and Uganda. According to the bank, several sub-Saharan African countries are expected to grow faster than Kenya, with Niger leading at 12.8%. These are the business stories we're tracking at this hour. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasome Peter. The news continues shortly. Bye for now. Business news in association with Money Master PSB. The easy way to master your money.